All right, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a very special guest with us this evening. Some of you know Dr. Drew, some of you don't. Will y'all please give him a warm welcome? How's it going, everybody? He's, he's going to introduce himself and, and talk a little bit about himself before we, before we get started um, or before we really get into it. But I want to get and pray, and, um, and we'll jump right into it. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Holy Spirit, the living God, I ask you to, to just conduct this conversation. Speak to us, speak through us, and bring value into all of our lives here, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So again, this is Drew. Uh, Drew, you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about yourself and... Let everybody know what kind of a wonderful person you are that <laughs> his wife would agree. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, and we're, speaking of uh, personal, we're about to talk about a lot of personal stuff here. Uh, but yes, uh, born and raised Boca Raton, Florida. I uh, found my uh, relationship with Jesus starting off at pretty early on at the age of eight through a lot of turmoil and trials. Um, eventually led me to University of Central Florida in Orlando, went to dental school in Lecom in Bradenton, Florida, and then the Lord brought me into the military, uh, thanks through a lot of saving debt. Um, and if you would have asked me about 10 years ago if I would have been here on the stage, let alone at Fort Liberty, the Fayetteville area, I would have laughed at you. Um, it has been such a unique journey. Uh, currently married for 10 months. Woo Thank you. Thank you. And we are currently in our 38th week of pregnancy. So, Congratulations, Papa, uh, Mama. What you call efficient, I guess. You get <laughs> but yes. anywho. Uh, but yeah, we're looking forward to that season. So well, that's I a little am, bit about me. I am so glad that you're, you're here. I've known Drew. In fact, I want to say I met you at not this past, the last men's retreat, but the previous men's retreat. And Drew has a fascinating testimony. God's done some amazing things in his life. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted him to join me for what we're discussing this evening is because, one, he comes into contact with a lot of people. Um, when we talk about him, we're going to be talking about personalities, and we're going to talk, talk about the importance of understanding your personality and other people's personality in the context of effective communication, conflict, a, a lot of interesting stuff. So I would imagine you do get to talk to a, a plethora of different people. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's a dentist. I, I think he made that clear anyway. But yes, uh, I deal with a lot of people sometimes in their most fearful moments. Oh, uh, sometimes we end up getting in conflict because we don't agree on what needs to happen. Um, so yeah, there is. But I can also attest to a lot of times where I feel more like a psychologist than I do a dentist because people get in that chair and they confess everything to me. It's kind of interesting. Especially when he gives them the gas. <laughs> you know, the, anyway, anyway. So we're going to talk about making it personal. We're going to talk about um, um, honing our skills in the area of understanding ourselves and others. This is actually open to text questions. So if you're watching online or you have questions that you'd like to, to ask throughout, the, throughout this particular service, please text them. Drew will get those. And um, depending on what they are, we may answer them right here, or we will at some point. So making it personal. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, obviously this isn't all of it, but it says, Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. This speaks of the diversity, but it also speaks of the unity within the diversity. In other words, what can that diversity bring about? It can bring about the, the clear, concise, powerful functionality of a body. So it takes every member to animate adequately and effectively. The next scripture is Romans 12, uh, 4 and 6. It says virtually the same thing. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I, I think one of the, one of the big um, issues when it comes to personalities and dealing with different people is that when people aren't exactly like we are, we have a, a tendency sometimes maybe not to appreciate it as much as we, as, as much as we should. Um, sometimes we become defensive or our immaturity can show. When, when people are different. And so I, I think for us being intentional about allowing people to be different is very important. I, when, I'm, when I'm talking to communicators or we're bringing people along, I really encourage them to be themselves. Drew is, 
He's himself. He's his, he beat kind of marches to his own drum. Uh, I think he's really kind of embraced that. But the diversity makes it up. One more, one more uh, scripture that I believe is pertinent to the topic that we're talking about before we dive in. Proverbs 12 or 27, 19 says, As in water face, uh, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. Now, very often you've heard me give the functional definition of what the heart is, the mind, the will, the emotions, and the morals. Those are what compile the personality of an individual. So it says the same way, so a man's heart reveals who that man really is. So there's some unseen aspects of us and even of you and those that you find yourself working with or maybe even in your own home if you have children that aren't obviously seen just by looking at the exterior. There's, there's certain things on the inside that really affect and, and really show who we are with, clar- with clarity. So, how important is it to understand yourself, the tendencies of your own, own personality? Drew, you want to speak to that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I remember growing up uh, and going through the ups and downs of my life. I didn't understand uh, how I fit in into society, let alone God's body. Like I was super confused. And it wasn't until I started to realize how God had uniquely designed me and created me that I really started to kind of hit my stride in, in some new ways and develop an intimacy with the Lord in ways that I never thought uh, possible. Um, and I, I guess I'll start with this too, is there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. And in that, you are being defined, we are being defined constantly by our environment or through another truth being God and the Bible. Uh, And because of this, we must recognize that either God has lovingly designed you or the devil wants to utterly destroy you. And that is so important to realize is that this is not just us living this world, doing whatever we want. There are forces at play here that know you sometimes better than you know yourself. Satan used scripture, God uses scripture. Which are you gonna believe? And because Satan wants you, he's gonna know how to get to you, and he's gonna try to play you like a fiddle. So it's kind of a a spiritual version of the nurture versus nature. So there are influences and understanding yourself and understanding how you respond to those influences for me is incredibly important. We're going to jump into the kind of the nuts and bolts that I really want, I really want us to get some of the things that we're going to be talking about. But I think that very often if, if we don't really know ourselves, we really do ourselves a disservice when it comes to helping other people. And we're going to look at that in depth in just a minute. So how important is it for you to understand others? Now, dirty trick, God said, husbands, dwell with your wives in an understanding manner. So he expects us to do the, to to, to understand a woman. Okay, ladies, I love you, but y'all are difficult to understand sometimes. I think we'd all agree. Even the ladies would agree with that. But when it comes to being able to understand others, part of that is being able to relate. We're really not that different. There's really a lot of the, the same fears and anxiety or fears and worries and, and um, influences, like he said, that are kind of pushing on, on all of us. So, so how important, even in the functionality of your job, is it important, how important is it for you to recognize and understand a patient in a particular situation? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what they tend to call it is case selection. So if, for example, a common procedure that I do is wisdom teeth extractions. So, um, and depending on the person, what I, what I tend to do is um, I'm not trained to put people to sleep. So sometimes if someone's in a lot of pain and we need to get done right away, we gotta take the tooth out then and there. However, there are times where people are so scared, they're so tense, you got to knock me out, brother. No, yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> that I need, I need to make the judgment call based off of my experience, my skill, my capability, and say, this is out of my scope. This is something that is going to be very difficult, and it's not going to be helpful for me. I'm going to get frustrated. The patient's going to get frustrated. My assistant's going to get frustrated. Sometimes they'll take a swing at me if they're really, really uh, <laughs> nervous, and they just don't realize it. But yes, like, 
um, it is important to understand the situation and the personality or the potential issues the problem can, uh, the person can have in front of you. So two, three, four people can have the same um, level of fear, same level of anxiety or concern, trepidation, whatever you want to call it, and they can all respond very differently. Absolutely. So, so I think based on people's response, sometimes if we're not careful, we can marginalize them. Now, when you categorize, when you talk about personalities, I want to warn you, we're going to warn, I want to give you several warnings as we kind of go through this, but be, be careful when it comes to marginalizing people because of the perception of their personality, the perception of the personality that they have. I want to, I want to touch on this one, and this one is huge. I think this one is one that is a, a catalyst. This is one of the reasons that we are focusing on this conversation tonight. Self-awareness versus self-consciousness. And when I'm self-conscious, that means I'm consumed with what other people are thinking. Now, now that, is, that is a negative. When you become self-conscious, when you're, when you're always thinking, what are they thinking? It, it, can, it can go from your dress or to your hairstyle. In other words, you begin living life for somebody else. But if you're self-aware, what does that mean? We, we, there's another word that, that is thrown around in our culture a lot, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is first applied to you before you apply that or utilize that in context with anybody else, be it conversation or otherwise. So think about um, uh, uh, emotional intelligence as the level of self-awareness that a person's operating in. I'll give you an example. I understand my personality. I have what would be referred to, and I'm not going to get into a lot of the terminology that, that define personalities, choleric, phlegmatic, and you know, those type of things, and some of the other tests, and many of you have probably taken tests, but some of, a, some of the proclivities of my personality, understanding those and, and augmenting those intentionally, that self-awareness, okay? Self-conscious is going to cause me to shrink back. Self-awareness is going to cause me to make an adjustment so that I can move forward, whether it's in the context of being accepted, whether it's in the context of communicating something that needs to be communicated. And, and there are tales. I'm, I'm self-aware, and so you'll hear me repeat certain words because I'm I'm, you could call it self-conscious because of the accent that I have, because of the demographic that we're here in the South. And I'll joke and I'll kind of make a thing out of it because I'm not, I'm, I'm self-aware when it comes to that. I know that sometimes it can be tough for you guys to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, but there's a difference in doing that and then going, well, you know, I'm self-conscious because I'm, I'm not going to talk in front of those people. I'll sound like an idiot. I really don't care about sounding like an idiot. So there's my out. That's another personality trait. So what are areas where being self-aware has brought you value and areas that being self-conscious have been detrimental? Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's go to my competitive side. Let's mm. start there. Uh, growing up, I was a younger brother initially. Two, two sisters came on later on. But I also had five or six other cousins, but I was the youngest of all of them. And what that led to, because I was so competitive, I was also very um, conscientious of what others thought of me. So I'm going to go both, both mm -hmm. answer both questions through this. But my competition at times, if I didn't win, no matter the fact that my brother was three years older than me, uh, I would get start in fist fights, start cussing, screaming, crying, everything, just because of the fact that I lost the game. Flipping tables during Monopoly games because I'm realizing I'm losing. Like I could not control myself, and my the situation did not uh, warrant that based off of my behavior. Um, and what this turned into is I felt like my value and worth in life was based off of whether I. I was winning, whether if I could achieve uh, a good grade, for example. One of the things that I remember from a young age is I wanted my dad's approval so much mm. that I would even lie to him just to get that approval, that, those attaboys. And I would just go and go and run myself into a ground. And then the minute that I would fail or make a mistake, I would come down so hard on myself. And I wasn't aware of that until my dad told me, Andrew, you're being too hard on yourself, and here's why. I love you regardless of whether or not we win this game. And that was something that was probably the first point where I realized, oh, shoot, maybe I'm taking this too far. Mm. 
So that, how does that self-awareness augment your behavior or your personality now? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, sometimes on Saturdays, I like to play volleyball or soccer or something. And I catch myself because I have a certain standard that I think I should be playing at, for example. And if I don't meet that standard, for example, playing horseshoes as well during the men's retreat. I think he cheated. <laughs> So he did throw a temper tantrum over the cornhole, but that's a different story. <laughs> Was that so, a third place trophy? I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh man, see, he, he's he getting be- on my competition side right now. So yeah. I, he yeah. did behave himself very yeah. well. I got to hand it yeah. to you. Yeah. So I mean, but realizing the situation, realizing when I can push myself, and realizing, hey, this is just a game. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna enjoy it. Um, as I've learned to do that, that has actually helped me to enjoy and also focus on people. Because at the end of the day, whether if I have a trophy or not or win a game isn't going to last, but the way I make people feel and how, I, how they perceive me, that is going to last. Okay, so let me ask you this, and you can be candid. Sure. We're all family here. You can be open and honest. So, so sure. was, it, was it pretty normal? And we're talking, we're talking um, after Christ, mm-hmm. after Christ, that you would maybe be playing flag football, you would be playing basketball, you would do something, and even if you won, you would end up walking away there with a sense of remorse because of your behavior? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. and, and so, that, so you're telling me that that, that actually that kept going in your life for a while. So, so how did the self-awareness, what were, what were things that helped you develop the self-awareness that you didn't lose your testimony, mm-hmm. but you were still able to enjoy the, the event and what was Ooh, going on? Well, or the competition. Yes. We're built for competition. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I had to go back deep into my past in order to recognize where this all was coming from. And it was coming from a deep-seated lie that, again, my value was based off of whether if I won or not. So my self-worth was going down. And what I didn't realize is someone had to come and talk to me and walk me through that and say, Drew, your life in God's eyes is not based off of whether if you win a game or not. In fact, they pointed me to Scripture saying that you are his son, redeemed, and that your value is not based off of that. So Psalms 139 says we are created specifically in the image of God with a purpose, with a meaning. Games are fun, but it is much deeper than that, and your val- you need to change your value, your value system, your paradigm, if you will. And so that helped me to start realizing what are the lies that Satan has been planting inside of me. And it was those deep-seated lies that I needed to root out, bring to the light. And those things are the things that I realized once I became aware, so much easier to fight, so much easier to understand why I act the way that I act and why I behave the way I behave. I mean, uh, Anna and I, 10 months, we've had plenty of arguments about various things. But as I brought, as I understood that, I was also able to bring that to her, help her understand my tendencies, my conversations. So when I get frustrated and I shut down, she's able to knock on my heart and say, hey, Drew, like, you're going here. So having somebody who knows your, your, your tendencies may be reminding you, hey, are you aware that you're going down this road? So some of it is on yourself to work through that. You know, the heart is, is deep waters, but a man of understanding finds it out. And so having those people in your life who know you intimately enough to help you through that, it could be a wife, it could be a friend, it could be all sorts of people, but it can also be your own self-awareness and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Definitely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like he, like when I see a tendency, man, he brings scripture, he brings so past experiences to mind where he just says, Drew, you're, you're going down this road again. You're bringing yourself under this heavy burden that I've already lifted. You don't need to act this way, which is the way of the world. Um, so I have a tendency to want to go there, but those are some of the things that have helped me along the way. So I, I see what, he's, what, what he just said, I see in counseling over and over and over, and I've made this statement in several, if you've been coming for any amount of time, you've heard me say this. That every stronghold in your life, whether it's one of the one of the personality things that are out of whack, we, you, your personality was given to you by God. 
You can operate in the strength or you can operate in the weaknesses, the strengths to the advancement of the kingdom. And if you operate in the, strength, the weaknesses of that same personality, it can be to the detriment of yourself and everybody around you. But the strongholds in our lives in the area of personality or relationship, whatever it is, are built on what he said, a lie. So as soon as you find the lie and you destroy the lie and you change the mind concerning that, you free yourself from the influences of that lie. As a man thinketh, I'm going King James on you, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. In other words, what, what that's saying is, is your perception very often becomes a reality. If that reality is inconsistent with God's reality, it's called a deception and you find yourself in bondage. So uh, very often, if you, can, if you can pinpoint the lie, whether it's in counseling, whether it's in the context of your own fears and your own personality deficiencies, or you can find out why I'm operating in a weakness as opposed to a strength, and I'll give you examples of that in a few minutes, then that, that rings true. Once you find the lie, you can destroy the stronghold. So the role of personalities in communication, again, if you have questions, there's a text number on there. I, I think that... Um, this is incredibly important. I think very often that we have, have you ever, some people are, diff, I'm trying to say this in a, very, in a very diplomatic way, but when it comes to roles and personalities in communication, different personalities communicate in very different ways. And some, some of that is easier to deal with than others, okay? Uh, some people are the the ability and, and this is one of the reasons why we do different teachers up here one of the reasons that and this is strategic you would, if you went through starting point you probably heard this one reason that we have a drew and that we have a, a, a eric or we have you know dan and myself and we rotate is because different personalities can effectively communicate to different personalities i have a personality that is is, is kind of a very extrovert in nature um, it's very, I'm, I'm kind of a direct person. I think you guys have probably uh, pulled, I'm, I'm very truth oriented in that. So there's a lot of things that kind of influence how I come across and that does affect your communication. And, and realizing that means that sometimes you have to change or augment that, that, that communication style. That's why it's important to know your audience. There are, there are certain people in here right now whose personality is one that is very, very analytical. You have a very analytical personality. Everything runs through the filter of information. If I'm not getting information, I'm not getting touched. And, and then over here you have other personalities that are, are much more inclined to, to feel what somebody is saying as opposed to hear what somebody is saying. They're not wrong. But that's why it's so important when you're going to communicate, you have to understand the diversity of the communication. And maybe you tell a story. Maybe you inter intersperse that with facts. But knowing who you're talking to, incredibly important when it comes to communication. Oh, absolutely. And even in my dental practice, some of the biggest forms of communication tends to come more nonverbal than it is even verbal. Ouch! Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody <laughs> clenches their fists as I'm going. It's like, oh, are you still numb? No. Why didn't you tell me? Um, so that happens. Some of you, unfortunately, have experienced that. We try. We try. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. And like communication, depending on your personality, it will determine what you communicate, how you communicate, when you communicate, to whom you're going to communicate, and even like in what degree. If I don't feel safe around you, I'm not going to share with you my entire testimony. All the deep, dark secrets, like, for example... Uh, that when I was really, really young, I got uh, involved in actually a child-on-child -child por pornographic relationship. Now, the reason why I'm able to explain that to you right now is that that's my comfort comes from God. Ten years ago, I would have never mentioned this in front of a stage. And God has even redeemed that. And because of that, I can now communicate that with other people. It has taken me years to get to that point. But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you, or even for you and me, at times, are very guarded because we don't trust. And your personality is going to reflect that, whether you potentially hide, wear a mask. Sometimes you just project. Now with uh, social media these days, I mean, we can project so many things based off of our personality, whether if we realize it or not. Um, sometimes I return refer to Facebook as fake book. Mm. Sometimes Instagram is, uh, you know, just uh, insta-fake. You can say it that way. Um, there are just 
lots of ways in which our personalities come out. And if we don't understand that, uh, we're going to cause a lot of division. From a believer standpoint, we can cause a ton of division. Yeah, so many times I hear people and they're, they're saying one thing with their mouth, their, their personality, by the time it filters through. I, I tell people this, that, and I think this is important, the, in the area of communication, let's just say that it, when, when we're up here talking and we're teaching and we're, we're preaching, a lot of times we're, we're sharing the same gift. I believe that a lot of our communicators are gifted teachers, but the, the personality is the conduit of expression for the gifting. So we can have the same gifting to teach or to minister or to uplift, but it comes across very different based on personality. Another aspect of the roles, uh, the role of personalities in conflict, this is one for relationships. You've got to catch this one. I see this with husbands and wives a lot. I see this in, in relationships with close friends and all the time. But when we talk about roles of personalities in conflict, what we're really talking about is the value system adopted by certain personalities. D did you hear that? Very often, your personality is reflective of something deeper. So, so stay with me. We say that the same way in a, in a church or in your home, your value determines your culture, right? Well, internally, your value very often will determine your personality. Can I give you some examples? Now, I think when it comes to conflict, very often we miss it. We look at what they're saying, but we don't understand the value from which they're saying it. Different values have different priorities. Now, we may have the same we may have the same top five values in our lives, but that doesn't mean they're structured exactly the same. My wife and I, I am a, I'm a time-oriented person. That is, that's a pretty high value thing for me. I'm not saying that she doesn't want to be. It's just my personality is kind of wired. I, I'm just wired that way to, to, if I'm not 15 minutes early, I'm late. Okay, so, but that's a value that I have that is actually driven because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be considerate of somebody else. So, so the value there is to be considerate of the person who's waiting on me. But I, does that stop me from, th does that make it okay? Not necessarily, but I'll tell you what, it makes it a lot easier on my wife when she realizes that I'm, I'm not just trying to do it to make her miserable. So on that note, actually, we have a question here. It says, are you able to speak into your wife's life in reference to when they're going down the wrong path? How do they receive it? I'm not sure I understand that question. No, <laughs> that, that's a good question. That's why it's so important. The Bible says dwell with your wives in an understanding manner. This is incredibly important. I, I remember a conversation I was having with my wife. And this is when we were, we were early on. And I may have shared this in the marriage conference. If you've heard it, it's okay. And, but I come to her and I addressed an issue. And my wife and I share very similar personalities. She'll attest to this. We are very, we're kind of extrovert. When it comes to mind, it comes to mouth. That's what that means in case you're wondering. So we were, were having a conversation. I addressed a particular issue. And, and, and it got a little fiery. It got a little heated, as can happen with two extroverts. And I come back later and I said, let me ask you something. I said, um, was there a particular way that I could have addressed that that would not have caused that response? We always do an after action after the fight. It's incredibly important. And, you know, because I'm going, you know, is there any hope that I'll ever be able to address this without losing a pound of flesh? That's what we guys want to know. And she said, uh, I'll never forget. She said, no, and thank you. So she said, I said, so you're telling me that there was really no way that I could have said that that would have not sparked the emotional response that you had. She said, no, and thank you. She said, thank you for being man enough to call me on something that I was wrong, regardless of what my behavior or my response with that was going to be. And she has done the same thing with me. Let me tell you what we rely on. Something that we must yield to, the secret sauce in the Christian life, Drew mentioned it earlier, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power to yield to the augmenting force of God in our lives when it comes to personalities, when it comes to morals, and when it, becomes, when it comes to decisions. It's incredibly, in, incredibly important. Um, so will certain personalities take things different ways? Yeah. But as she has matured, that's been years ago, as I have matured, we're learning each other, learning that there's a value behind it. 
when she understands that I'm addressing it because I value her or vice versa, oh man, it's, it's a world of difference. It's a world of difference. Yeah, uh, and uh, also to maybe help address this question um, in terms of uh, how does she receive when I'm speaking into my wife's life about potentially going down the wrong path? It is very helpful for me to understand who Anna is in order to do this properly. She has also gone through specific trauma, specific woundings. Uh, she has her own personality, which unlike Tony, her and I are fairly different. We do have an extroverted uh, similarity between us, but the way that she processes information and I process information, very, very different. And because I've asked those questions and over time been a student of my wife's life, learned about her past, her history, what her traumas are. For, for example, sometimes in a woman's life, uh, rejection is a huge thing. So if I communicate in such a way, especially in conflict, where it makes it sound like I'm rejecting her, man, she shuts right down. But if I can know that and understand that, I can address her in a sense of saying, babe, for example, let's just say maybe she's feeling bad because uh, a meal wasn't prepared. This is something that has happened in our relationship before. And first off, I'm able to say, Anna, you are very capable of doing this. Maybe time got away with you, maybe because of the fact that you're 38 weeks pregnant, that you've felt like you've had a lot of injury, you are capable, you can do this. And even though it's a setback, we can just go down to Chick-fil-A and grab something. And it completely relieves her self-consciousness about this. And I'm also able to bring up to her, hey, like, I think you're, you're, you're dwelling on this a little bit too much. Because at the end of the day, like, food w will come on the table one way or another. Um, and it's also taking the pressure, helping taking the pressure off of herself because she has a tendency towards that. And it's a beautiful thing when you're able to recognize, communicate in such a way that speaks to against her woodings in a sense, giving her truth, giving her freedom from that. So let's get into the nuts and bolts and maybe this will help you in the context mm -hmm. of your relationship. When we talk about the values in, con in, in conflict, very often you know and you appreciate the values, but you may not recognize the values. So let me just give you some examples. If you've got somebody who we would refer to as an extreme extrovert or a choleric, and there's, I know there's a lot of, I'm not trying to put titles or, uh, I, don't, I wanna stay away from the terminology tonight, but when you have somebody like that, they value progress. Very often what drives them in, in the context of relationship, we want, we want the relationship going forward. At work, we want the work to, to, to progress. Uh, we want things to grow, and, and that can be a value. And that can be exhausting to somebody who doesn't recognize that that is the motivation. Maybe it's a, a phlegmatic or an introvert type of personality, and guess what they value? They really value peace. Well, what happens when you really want something to grow and thrive and you're, you're seeing that thing grow and, and then you have somebody who really values, you know, that, that relational uh, peace kind of thing? Who do you want driving that corporation? Who do you want driving that thing forward? The person who is, a go who is going to avoid conflict in order to retain peace or the person who's going who's gonna to not be afraid of conflict for progress? Now, that's, that's tough. And what I'm submitting to you right now is it's not an either or. It's a recognizing of the value of both. So what if there is a balance? And this is what I want to say. Christ in the context of personality, with all of the different aspects and values of personality, there's Christ right in the middle. It's our brokenness that allow, allows one area of our personality to be dominant to our detriment. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. See, every single one of us values relationship or values peace. We want peace if you're a believer. But you also probably want progress because you're mission-minded. So which one of those is going to determine, do you see, the conflict on the other one? Maybe uh, when I say phlegmatic, maybe that, that's unity. What are the other ones? Some, somebody may really appreciate the journey. They want, they just, they want to have fun. They want to have joy. They want to really make it about the experience. And they're content to just kind of hang out and, and party in their area. They're not very progressive. Um, you know, there's a lot of different personality uh, combinations. 
But there's, if you look closely, very often what you can see is you can see the value. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. When you find yourself in conflict, if you can recognize the personality, introvert, extrovert, whatever that might, might look like, and find the value there, guess what it does? It increases your value of them and their perception. And you can see how some of their value can rub off on you, and we can get closer to the goal. So dealing with difficult personalities. Um, this is hard. I mean, because some personalities, anybody have a personality that just gets on your nerves? And let, let, me, let me make it real. You know, do you work or know somebody in your family who just absolutely gets on? You know, sorry, Sam, I love you. He's talking about me. Absolutely just gets on your nerves. I mean, it's okay. You could say that. I mean, you could say, yes, there are certain people who I cannot deal with. Recognize their value, okay? Um, <laughs> because there's a good chance their personality is not going to change unless their value changes. If, if it's somebody who has just a, just a messed up core values, you couple that with the, the fruit of that personality, and it can be a hot mess to deal with. So, Drew, how do you deal with difficult personalities? Oh. And no well, cheating and looking at my notes. Either, I got four <laughs> answers to this question. No, I'm yeah. Um, well, I'll speak to this in the context of believers, just to be clear here. So I actually was able to be a roommate with a guy that was the polar opposite of me. I was more of a big picture guy. He was down to the nitty gritty detail guys and details just drive me up a wall at times. Uh, if we spend a lot of time on it versus uh, we'd be talking about different biblical principles and you know, I'd be like, okay, here's the gist of it. This is good. Like I I'm good with that. But he's like, no, no, no. Like let's dive deeper. And I'm just like, dude, we gotta, we, we, we gotta talk about so much more. Like this is so much more important. And we would miss each other all the time. And what I had to realize was that one, uh, or remember rather, is God has made Ethan, my buddy, uh, very specifically, very uniquely, and that I can actually learn from him. So I think one good uh, standard or idea that you can have whenever you're talking with somebody who's a little difficult for you, if they're in the body of Christ, if they're proclaiming Jesus Christ, is to look at them and say, how can I actually learn from this individual? Ask yourself the question, and ask them how they got to those specific ideas or, or who they are. Um, and the easy way to do that is just ask them about who they are and what their story is. That will tell you so much about who they are and how God has gifted them. If you find yourself in conflict with a difficult personality, now it's starting to learn how that individual maybe is perceiving you rather than what you perceive they're perceiving of you. Let me give you an example. My wife and I, being very, very uh, uh, different in the terms, I remember I'm the uh, big treetop guy, she's the very detailed guy. Whenever we're trying to, we were trying to plan for our wedding. This is a great one, I love this. Uh, we were trying to play for, plan for our wedding and I was just trying to hit the treetops. You know, let's walk, here's certain music, or whatever. At times, she really wanted to get into the details, and I didn't want to go there. Um, and again, going back to understanding her, what her values are, she cares more about, for example, being together with people versus necessarily always having to be around, you know, getting all the pictures and stuff. I was like, no, and I'm like, nope, we need to do this, we need to do this, because that's what you do at a wedding. Um, we had to work through that. Um, and so in order to deal with her, I had to understand what she was really trying to get at. And it wasn't always uh, my perception that was actually on point. So she valued order and relationship. And it's like the guy that you're talking about, the, the, the friend that you mentioned, mm -hmm. he really valued that order. And very often that, that's a good thing. They value those little details. You've heard they, they live by the motto, the devil's in the details. And, and that's true. And then you've got the big picture people who are more visionary. So Drew, he values progress. So you see in the area, he wanted to get the wedding done. He wanted to get these things checked off because he wanted to get to the honeymoon. Now, I'm sure she knew that, so that's not a surprise. But he's trying to get through it, and she's trying to enjoy every moment and dot every I and cross every T. You put that together, you have a great event, or you have a big fight. You see the point. So if you can recognize the values of dealing with those difficult personalities, four, four things very quick. Number one, when it comes to dealing with people with different personalities, model alternatives. 
model alternative responses and alternative ways of communicating and dealing with people. Number two, suggest alternative approaches, especially if this is at work. You say, well, you, you know, and this is a way to help somebody. I, I know you may value this, so you can relate to them, and that's, that's another one. I, I know you value this, but, but what if you would, that's a huge door opener, or would you consider or another way too, especially if you can re recognize they're running into a roadblock because of their personality, you can help them. Number three, address inappropriate behavior. That is inappropriate. It's okay to say that is inappropriate with somebody who has a very strong personality that is born and spawn of Satan himself. Again, somebody with a strong personality without the Holy Ghost can wreak havoc on your life if you're not, if you're not prepared to deal with them. So it's okay to look at somebody and say, you are behaving inappropriately. That means there's a level of self-awareness or emotional intelligence that they may not be operating in. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm being clear. There is a time to look at somebody in their carnality and say that's inappropriate. Um, they may double down, but they'll remember that you, you address that issue, especially if it's in your workplace, even if it's a superior and they do something or, or whatever, that's inappropriate. Address from the values perspective. When people understand that you understand I'll give like Drew scenario, brother, I know you value those details and they are juicy morsels and every single bite is important. But if we're ever going to get this camel, we got to start munching. You, you see, so all of a sudden you're able to relate on a, on a core value level. So the role of personality in ministry, again, the personality is the conduit of expression of the gifting that you've been, you've been given. And this is one reason we're talking about it. We're talking about unwrapping our gifts, our spiritual gifts in Christ. That gift may look different depending on your, on your, your personality. Um, and that's why we talked about gift projection. I, I, I don't expect somebody who is an introvert to deal and deliver and communicate in ministry or do ministry like I would do it. Um, uh, and you also have experiences that play a part in that. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. So turning weaknesses into strengths. Let me give you an example. So one of the weaknesses that, that somebody with a personality like mine can deal with, I have to know me. Trust me. I have to know my proclivities. I can come across as bossy. Okay? Right? You don't have to say yeah, if you, especially if you work for me. Anyway, so I understand. But what is, what is the strength of bossy? A, a strong leader. You can be a strong leader that's a positive of the personality. That's a tempering of the bossy. D does that make sense? So you can have a weakness that can be leveraged by the Holy Spirit and it can be turned into what the, the initial strength of the personality was supposed to be. You may say, um, I have a, I'm a reticent, I have a very reticent personality. I'm, I'm a personality who is not gung ho or whatever. And you could turn that in into wisdom and caution, not fear. So you can operate in the negatives to your detriment, or you can turn those negative things on. The, the, normally, they're one side of the same coin, depending on if it's been tempered through the power of the Holy Ghost or not. If you don't know what your personality is, there's a lot of tests that you can take, and there's some questions that you can ask. So are you more comfortable making quick decisions, or do you really need to mull it over for a few days? True, quick decision maker, or, or does it take you days to come to, to a decision? I tend to be a quick decision maker. So you, you, you can see the whole picture really, really quick. Mm -hmm. do, do you see, and that's indicative of, of, a particular, of a particular personality. So conflict, do you deal with it head on, or do you really try to avoid it at all costs? My tendency would be to try to avoid it. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, but do you or do you not address it? Oh, yes, I addressed that. Did, did, you, did you see that? So he knows what the tendency is. So the tendency may be the same regardless of the personality, but how it's dealt with ultimately defaults to what the personality is. I think you'll see that over and over. But it's important. Every weakness that you have can be leveraged into a strength. So some warnings, and then we'll, we'll call this because we're about out of time. Number one, don't use your personality as an excuse. I am Irish. That means I should be a drunk and I'm, I'm kidding. I, I, should, I should drink a lot and have a short fuse. No, stop it. Your personality is not an excuse for carnality. Amen? Amen. Uh, two people got that. The rest of you is like, uh-uh. <laughs> My mama was mean and I'm going to be. All right, all right. Number two, don't let a personality limit your ability 
to lead or to learn. If you do not overcome the weaknesses of your personality, if you do not allow the Holy Spirit to turn those weaknesses into strength, it will cost you. It'll cost you in your ability to, to influence people for good. It'll cost you in your relationships, please. Also, don't, don't allow your personality to stop you from receiving from other personalities. Know yourself, be self-aware. If you know certain personalities are difficult for you to receive, you ever met somebody who talks really, really slow? See, half of you are mad at me right now. Do, do you see? So what you do is you recognize that, you know, and you hear me talk fast. You know how hard it is for me to listen to somebody. But what if that person has the very wisdom that you need? What's more important, how they deliver it or how you posture yourself to receive it? That's why it's incredibly important to be self-aware. Number three, don't miss the value driving the expression. Please, guys, don't miss the value driving the expression. Drew, closing thoughts. Um, man, your personality, each and every person in this room, uh, if you are in the body of Christ, or even if you're not in the body of Christ, you were made with a specific purpose, meaning it is not by mistake that you are here. It is not by mistake you are the way that you are. I would encourage each and every one of you, find out how God has gifted you. It is very unique and the body needs it. We are all one. And when you learn to hone that, the body benefits. You mean God was intentional? And there might yes. be some things that might be that God intended? Yeah. yeah. Man, Drew, thank you so much for your time. Guys, let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I have asked Drew to come back and share. Drew is a gifted teacher. He loves God. He has navigated some very difficult stuff, and I believe that God is going to use him in a powerful way. I look forward to, to dedicating that baby here very soon on this stage. I hope. I hope. Congratulations on, to the newlyweds and the baby, and let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and sometimes, God, unfortunately, we're the last to see it. We're the last to realize it. We get called up so much on the inside that we, we miss the wonderful things that you've done and are doing in and through us, and God, I just open our hearts, open our minds, allow us to see the value of the human beings, the persons behind the personality that are, that are surrounding us. Help us, God, to clearly see this. If we don't hear anything else, to clearly see this, that you have made us diverse and we are all members of your body, all capable of glorifying you and bringing value to one another. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks.